Good afternoon. Thank you for coming here today. Uh, I know some of you are getting pizza, but we have a lot of good material to cover, so I don't want to lose time. Uh, we have a spectacular faculty member today who I'm so lucky agreed uh, in her busy schedule, and she'll tell you in a few moments why it's going to get 100 times busier <laughs> in, in 24 hours. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, so Beth Moore uh, has been a dear colleague and friend uh, since I arrived here at Michigan and she's been the, one of the most welcoming people I've known here. Uh, so I'm so glad that she is going to be talking to us today on a very important topic. Uh, and if you guys see uh, at the end of your tables, there'll be a handout that Beth actually created custom for this particular uh, event. It's pretty spectacular, so thank you for doing My that. My pleasure. Uh, and Ali, uh, who is a postdoc uh, in the same department, We'll be moderating the event. So Ali will take it off and ask Beth a few questions and walk you guys through uh, this nice handout. Uh, Maggie told me to make an important announcement, which is that everything that you're eating on or eating with is compostable, and there's a compost bin on this side of the room. So please use that. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for coming today. Um, so as she mentioned, you have the outline in front of you, which I think will be good for facilitating uh, conversation today, what we should be talking about, and I also have a list of questions that people have submitted, so if we have any uh, moments of silence, I've highlighted some ones I'll be bringing up, but if people are willing to just keep asking questions, then we'll just keep doing that method um, until the end, and we'll leave about 10, 5 or 10 minutes at the end. Um, so that we can just touch on that list that you have in front of you, any of the points that might have not been addressed during the question and answer session. So with that, this is Dr. Moore, who is acting as the chair of immunology and microbiology currently. And I'd like to- I like the, or the reverse order, immunology and microbiology. <laughs> just for you. <laughs> Thanks. So um, first, I'm just going to ask her to uh, explain her background and hit on any points that are particularly relevant to uh, the discussion today. All right, my pleasure. It's uh, I'm excited to be here. It's really quite overwhelming to see how many people are here. If you cannot hear me, just you know, raise your hand. I want to make sure you can hear. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about myself. I um, grew up in Texas. I went to the UT Austin for my undergraduate, majored in microbiology thought I wanted to go to graduate school to study cancer, knew so little about graduate school that I thought I would have to pay out-of-state tuition if I went out of the state of Texas, so I only applied to graduate school in Texas. Fortunately, UT Southwestern in Dallas is a pretty good school, and I did get in there. To be perfectly honest, I did not get in there initially, but they had somebody who was accepted above me cancel at the last minute, and because I was a Texas resident, they called and asked if I would come. I had actually already booked an apartment and put money down on an apartment at a different uh, university in Texas. Um, so that will tell you about how much I felt I belonged there. I remember in my interviews there they asked me if English was my native language because my maiden name was French, <laughs> which I thought was interesting. Um, so yeah, kind of a weird school, but actually I had a wonderful experience at uh, UT Southwestern. Uh, the one thing about it is it's just a freestanding medical school, so what you don't get is all the interactions with all the other kinds of departments and other schools that a big campus gives you. Um, uh, just to be clear, I, got, I married my husband during graduate school, so we met when I was a second year graduate student. He was first year graduate student. We got married in our, my fourth year of graduate school and had decided not to have children but that didn't work out quite the way we planned because then I got pregnant the next year. And so I had uh, my first child uh, five months before I defended my PhD. Um, I'll tell you, if you're interested in that, I'm happy to talk about that later. I think it's a good thing that it happened that way because I don't know if I would have been able to go back to work except I was so close to getting that degree. Um, then I did a short postdoc at UT Southwestern while my husband, who was behind me in the graduate program, finished. We had another child, so I have two children. And then when my kids were um, two years old and three weeks old, we moved across the country to California to start a postdoc at Stanford. And I'm happy to talk about all the good and bad of all the imposter syndrome that that, that came up. We were so incredibly poor that um, at those times, you could um, still work a part-time job as a graduate student and as a postdoc. So I did have part-time jobs the whole time. I was a graduate student and a postdoc. 
Um, but I'll be perfectly honest, when my three-year time was up at Stanford, because it was, you know, you've got a three-year postdoc and at the end of it you had to leave, that was all there was to it, I was not marketable for a tenure-track job. I had an offer for industry, but I really wanted to try to do academics. And we had Gary Huffnagel, for those of you who know, happened to go to graduate school with us. We've been friends for 35 years. He was here already, and he let Tom and I know that it, um, there would be the possibility of research track faculty positions in pulmonary. So we came here for research track faculty positions um, in 1997, and then I worked my way up through the research track faculty um, to eventually, I, I was hired in medicine, which is a clinical department, and they, would, they didn't even have tenure track for PhDs when I first came in 97. Once that became a possibility, I worked my way over to the tenure track and up, um, and now I'm tenured in medicine, and um, am now I joined microbiology and immunology as a joint faculty member about 10 years ago, and as you just heard, um, the regents are voting on me today. So apparently, if all goes well, I will officially be the interim acting chair for microbiology and immunology this afternoon. And many of you in this room know that I've run the graduate program in immunology here for the last seven or eight years. So, so I've been here my whole career, but I've had a very non-traditional path. And I'm happy to answer any questions related to that. So, Does anybody want to start us off? Um, could you talk a little bit more about like research track positions that are not like tenure track positions and how you what those entail and how you navigate it? Yeah, so um, I'm, you know, I'm, in fact, we can have a whole separate workshop sometime if you want to about research track faculty because it's a difficult position and I am absolutely completely understand what that challenge is. I mean, I think, um, you know, to be perfectly honest, the University of Michigan. Uh, doesn't really recognize research track faculty. I mean, they recognize that you're faculty in that they will allow you to write a grant. And that's really what the only benefit, in some ways, of that position is. But you are still affiliated with someone else. You don't get your own lab space. You don't get your own office, generally. You know, all of those things are kind of terrible about it. But what the research track faculty did, I mean, for me, for me, the way, the way that I use it, and this is the way I talk to my research track faculty in my lab about it, is it's a hunting license. It basically buys you time to get your CV in order to show productivity, to learn new skills, to develop a CV that makes you more competitive, and it gives you the opportunity to at least submit a grant. So at Stanford, you were a postdoc or you were tenure track faculty. There was nothing else. I don't know if that's still true today, but when I was there, there was no in between. So I wasn't competitive to get a tenure track job coming out of my postdoc. I mean, I had two little kids and I was working a part-time job, and in some ways, it's kind of crazy thinking back on it. Um, but coming here in a research track job, in part, I was lucky in that I had fairly supportive mentors who allowed me to uh, work hard and you know build up that CV and then allowed me to have something that I could write a grant on. And then once I had a grant, then that gave me a little bit more um, leverage, frankly, in the negotiations to keep moving up. So, so I think uh, you know there's a lot of downsides to being a research track faculty. The, the thing that has to work is you have to hopefully have a supportive mentor who's willing to support your independent career development as well, and we can talk about that if you want to. Um, but I think what you really have to look at it as a time, as a hunting light, a time to build your own CV and an opportunity to write for grants and hope for the best. And then usually I think it would work better to go somewhere else. I mean, that's the other thing. My husband's also faculty here too, so two jobs at the same place at the same time definitely created some challenges as well. But I don't know if that answers your question, but I'm happy to answer more about that. Um, so follow up to that is several people wanted to know, um, is it required to have a grant in order to be eligible for a lot of these faculty positions? And then how do you know when you are ready to start? Yeah, I'm applying? very happy. So for sure, if you go, I mean, so there's really two ways to get a faculty position basically. So one possibility, you absolutely, if you are lucky enough to be a real superstar postdoc where you go to a lab, things work well in that time frame. So let me just talk about it. One thing you can do as a postdoc is write for a K99 R00. But to be clear, to be eligible for that, what that really means is that you have to write for that grant in your third year of postdoc so that because you're only eligible to it till year four and you'd like to have a chance to submit it twice and be able to get it back. So I will be honest, not that many people are so successful in their first three years of postdoc that they can write a grant, have the preliminary data, and have a great idea that they can take with them that is not going to directly compete with their mentor. So if you are lucky enough to be in that situation, you should absolutely write for a K99, and a K99 definitely opens doors for postdocs. 
Now you may have a hard time staying at the university where you are. You may have to be willing to move. And I will tell you that when I do a lot of um, counseling of you know people looking for jobs, that's when people who are able to move often have much better chances finding positions than people who are landlocked for one reason. That's just the nature of the thing. If you're willing to move to North Dakota or to Minnesota or you know wherever you know and move away from your family then there's always the opportunity to maybe you know find a position there and I, I didn't mean to disparage those states I was just like somewhere farther away from uh, that was not even disparaging I just meant that that somewhere farther away from Ann Arbor um, if you and if you have a super high impact paper it absolutely will open some doors for you and you may be able to get a bona fide tenure track job offer just by putting your name out you know applying for the jobs that are available going on the circuit and interviewing and, and if you, in that case, if you've got a really good idea to go forward and the school can see that, you've got good collaborative interaction potential with the people that are there. Because a lot of times what matters about when the school makes you an offer is how well you fit in with what they're looking for. I mean, that, you know, you should remember that it's not always that you weren't a good candidate, it's that they need a bacteriologist and you're a virologist or something like that, you know. Um, so if you're lucky enough to do that, you can get it without having a grant. If that four year time frame passes and you don't have those things, then there's no question, money opens doors um, because it proves two things. It proves you can, you've got good ideas, it proves that peer review likes what you do, and it proves that you can write a grant. Those are major things for being a good faculty member. And so if you can be in a research track faculty position and get a K-22 or a K-01 or you know hopefully an R-21 or an R-01, you will be, when you apply for the jobs that are posted, your application will rise to the top compared to the 75 or 100 other ones that may not have that funding. So funding will open doors, um, and there's no question about that. So you definitely don't have to have it, but I think, um, I think to not need it and be able to get a position, you need to get a little bit lucky, and you need to have a, a, a project that either gets published high impact somewhere is a big splashy something, and, or you have a fancy technique that you can take somewhere else. Those are the kinds of things that will help you get a job without having money. Does that make sense? So touching on the high impact publications, yeah. <laughs> several people were asking, and I think that's one of your bullet yeah. points on the sheet here, which is don't leave your data unpublished. Absolutely. So this is relevant for both graduate students <laughs> and postdocs. Absolutely. Um, yeah, people were asking about what if, what if your publication record is not as competitive, or um, and what do you think is more important, the quality of the papers that you're publishing, or the quantity, or is there some right. balance? Okay, so my I have a lot of thoughts about this. <laughs> my first thought is that all your papers should be quality. Quality does not equate with impact factor of where they're published. Every paper you publish, you better be proud of the data, it better be solid data. Do not publish anything that you do not consider quality. But you can publish a quality paper in PLOS One, you can publish a quality paper in the Journal of Immunology, and you can publish a quality paper in Nature. You can also publish a terrible paper in any of those places. So I think it should always be quality. Um, I, have, I sit before you having never published a cell, science, nature, nature immunology, science immunology, um, you know, none of those papers are on my CVs. Um, I still hope that we'll get one one day. I'm really proud of the fact that some of my graduate students who've left my labs have gotten those papers in their postdoc labs. <laughs> they haven't gotten them for me. Um, so I'm hoping that that's for training. I mean, those, there, I will not lie to you. There is a group of people, I think they're in the minority, but there's a group of people for which those kinds of publications matter. And they, and they carry a lot of weight. And if you're lucky enough to get one of those, it will open doors for you. If you are not in a field that happens to get that kind of public, because let's face it, some of it is field specific. Um, if you're not in that kind of field, or if you just didn't happen to get lucky enough to do that, then the next best thing is to publish a lot of papers. And I personally believe, I mean, I think I said on here, I am one of the papers that I am the best known for. If you were to go and ask my pulmonary colleagues, what did Beth do that makes her well known in the pulmonary fibrosis field? It was a CCR2 knockout mouse paper published in the Journal of Immunology. That has a, currently has an impact factor less than five. But that paper has been cited something like 400 times or something. That is the work I am most well known for. It's not a high impact paper. But if you look, you can see, you can definitely see a trajectory of the work that I've done over the years. And I think that's what you have to think about is you have to think about building a body of work. So I think you can always try, you know, shoot for the high impact paper, try to get the data for it as long as you can. And to be perfectly honest, the best time to get that is as a graduate student because that's where you have the most time to do it. 
Um, but if it doesn't work out, you know, shoot like crazy for it in the first three years of your postdoc. But I personally think if you're coming up on year four of your postdoc, it's better to start talking to your mentor about publishing a couple of papers or publishing a review in a paper because you really have to have track record. The thing that will kill your chances at a faculty position more than anything else is a CV that has nothing on it because a reviewer cannot tell the difference between whether you were doing great work that just hasn't quite gotten out yet or whether you did nothing. And so I think that the, you know, my real mantra is that you either have to, you know, go for high impact. Please always try. It's always worth trying. But, you know, there has to be that um, fine line that is really a conversation between your mentor about when is it, you know, when is it not in your best interest anymore? When is it important for you personally to leave? And I, I personally, my lab has run on graduate students over the years. I've had far more graduate students than I've had postdocs over the years. Graduate students need to learn to write. I personally think there's a lot more training in a graduate student writing three or four papers than there is in maybe that one big paper that's got so much data from other people. So I absolutely do not think that the message is, is that you have to have those high impact papers. I think absolutely they open doors for you and they matter to some people. But I promise you, I'm here today and I've never had one. <laughs> so. Um. So another thing you said, which I thought was really important and I actually haven't heard brought up very often, is your very first point, which is read, read, <laughs> read. Um, so people were asking about, uh, with the reading, how that affects your grant writing, paper writing, and then like how do you um, devote your time, I think, as a graduate student or a postdoc, you feel like you're sometimes getting pulled a thousand different ways. So. Yeah. Um, how do you like stay organized enough and make sure that you devote that time to reading? So I'll tell you that one of the things that I've always thought was interesting is it's hard to make yourself read because it's very easy to find everything else to do instead of doing that. But I have to say the reason I think I'm, if I've been successful as a faculty member, one of the reasons is because there is something enjoyable to me about writing a grant. And usually part of what's enjoyable about it is that you usually block off time to go read a bunch of papers in that area and try to catch up, right? Because you're, you definitely don't want to write the background of your grant and you know, not cite the most current paper in that field or whatever. I'm always amazed at when I, when I like, you know, go through PubMed, do the search, download 30 papers that I'm going to try to read, block off four days, sit in my, you know, usually at home actually because I can't get it done at home here at the office. When I read that kind of body of literature, I'm always furious at myself at all the stuff that's out there that I missed. And also, I mean, it's definitely a way to get ideas. So I think that there's something enjoyable about reading. And definitely, I think one of the points that I made is if you get stuck, if you're like, how do I move to the next field? Where do I go? Send yourself to the library, download 12 papers, and read and see if you get an idea from it. Because I really think that's where the, the ideas and the interest comes. You can usually find some way to you know, take this antibody that they used or pivot or something that you read about in this cell line might work in your cell line. That's really where the spark of ideas comes from. Or going to seminars. I also think going to seminars is another great way to get ideas and think about it. Um, so what I tell people, I think a reasonable goal is to read two papers a week. Um, and then the other thing is, is to try to remember what you read them because you're not going to remember that. And so if you do it electronically, try to put some comment boxes on it. And then I have tried to start um, filing my papers on my, you know, on my computer into folders. You know, this is about chemokines and fibrosis. These are about eicosanoids and fibrosis. You know, these are about diabetic wound healing or whatever, you know, different projects we have so that I'm trying to get the papers there because it is hard to go back and find them. Um, but then if you get an idea, this is maybe my most important advice, is if you come up with an idea, put it on a list and put the list over your computer or wherever you work. And do not think you're going to remember the idea. At least when you get to my age, you cannot remember what you talked about on Monday when you get to where <laughs> my students are sitting there and they will guarantee that this is true. Put it on a list. I mean, for a long time when I was an assistant professor, I had a list of ideas that was, you know, 10 or 15 or 20 different things on the list. I hadn't, hadn't gotten to all of them yet, but every time I had an idea, I wrote it down. And going back and looking at that list over and over again really helped me stay focused or helped me remember what I could do. Or when you had six extra mice that you didn't know what to do, it's like, ah, oh, I can do that experiment with those mice. So I think that that kind of organizational prompt helps. So we talked a lot about the you know academic things for a faculty track, but how important are outreach and like other volunteer 
I guess like extracurricular activities to your faculty application? Yeah, so I would love to tell, so <laughs> it's good news and bad news, right? So I will tell you that a lot of universities, almost all universities, are really looking for faculty members who know how to engage with a wide variety of learners. So outreach activities, DEI activities, volunteering, tutoring, all of those kinds of things that you do, those are the kinds of things that say to a university, I work well with different kinds of people, uh, this is important to me, all of that is good feeling. Um, but I hate to tell you that none of that can replace the science part of it, unfortunately. So all of that is just frosting on the cake and I think that those things help. And especially when it comes to like writing a teaching philosophy or something like that, I think those kinds of activities play very well into that. Some universities now are asking you to write a diversity statement and so those extracurricular activities can really help there. And, there, and I will say that it, there's a big difference between somebody who writes a diversity statement that, that you know, is completely you know, not about what really they're looking for. When they're asking for a diversity statement or whatever, they're asking about how do you work with different kinds of people. What kinds of activities or seminars or workshops or you know, things have you done that prove that you can work with a lot of different kind of people, that you're an open-minded person, that you accept people of all different colors, races, you know, whatever. That's what they're looking for. They are not asking you to talk about, you know, the, the you know, sometimes diversity statements come through. It's funny, I was on a, a panel for EEB and they like talked about their travel and stuff and, and like, you know, souvenirs they had bought and things like that. It was like really very off base, you know, so, so that, that kind of stuff, it can give you help in those pieces. But I think the truth of the matter is most universities are going to be hiring you for your science. And in fact, as much as I would love to say, a, teach, a small liberal arts teaching school will care about your teaching experience and your teaching philosophy and, the, and that kind of stuff. Um, and they do not want you just to have been a TA where you graded. They want you to have actually been a TA where you developed curriculum or you know some pedagogy of the class where you really helped do that. For a small liberal arts school or a school where teaching, you're getting paid to teach and research is sort of the frosting, then the teaching piece becomes much more important. But I have to sadly admit that at a school like the University of Michigan, your teaching will not matter to them. I mean, it on main campus more so than in the medical school. But in the medical school, you're gonna be getting hired because of your science and what you can do there. And they're gonna hope that you're a good teacher. Um, and they're gonna provide some you know, CRLT training and all, and hope that you'll do that. But it is not, it is, you know, in, in a big R1 research university, that is not valued like it should be. I disagree with that, but it is the truth, I think. Yeah? So, running down the list, but in a similar vein, course five is talking about mentoring and seek mentoring. So by the time that we get to the point of like that year two, three, four postdoc, a lot of us have pretty extensive mentoring experience and have had successful undergraduates that we've mentored. Mm -hmm. What do you think the best way to communicate that in an application package or a grant package is? Because I always struggle with that. Like, what do, I, what do I put that in? Yeah, I mean, um, I think that comes, some of that comes down to the teaching philosophy. That's where I think you talk about, you know, in your laboratory-based teaching. I think what is important is for you to talk about whether, or, or at least let me say what I've seen, the successful faculty applications that I've seen where they've talked about this stuff, it's usually where they talk more about how they help the student design an independent project, and then they talk a little bit about how they helped mentor the student through the challenges of the project much more so than um, the ones that come through and it's more like I taught this student how to do PCR, they did all my PCR reactions for me and I made them third author on the paper. <laughs> so I think, what you want, I think what you want to do is talk about the process of mentoring, about you know, what you found, and then you know, sometimes about you know, what you found challenging or what you found rewarding about that experience. And especially what they love in those kinds of things is you know, what did, if you did something, like if there was some roadblock that you figured out some creative way to help the student get over, you know, that's the kind of thing to talk about in those in those teaching statements or your mentoring statements that you write as part of your application. So I think it's a little bit more more important than the results that the person got. I think you want to think about writing about the process. If that does that help answer that? As a follow up to that, um, see so mostly in graduate school and postdocs, I think most of us are mentoring undergraduate students, and you can definitely learn a lot about you know how to mentor different people. <laughs> Um, but how is that different from when you're in faculty now, you're going to be mentoring also graduate students and postdocs and senior scientists and all sorts of, can you apply the general same principles or do you feel you need to get, try to find other um, sources for experience while you're training? 
Yeah, so I guess just a few thoughts, and I think this is true at any level. I mean, my feeling about undergraduates is that if they are putting time and effort in and are helping, you know, are, are really invested in it and you're finding the experience rewarding and they're useful to you, then I think that's worth putting your time and effort into. The minute that that is not true, then that is the kind of thing you want to say no to and find, a, <laughs> find something else. There are plenty of people who want to work in labs that are going to work hard for you, work well for you, you know, put time and effort into it. So my general piece of advice is you should not waste your time on people who are not giving it their full effort. Science is a competitive field. They should learn from the get-go that if they're not willing to be you know, engaged and put effort in, then better for them to move on to business or something, I don't know. Um, as far as mentoring, I, I think it's very hard to mentor. I think mentoring is a very difficult skill. What I will say, I think a mistake I see happen often is that uh, new faculty members come in and the first thing they want to do is hire a postdoc. And a postdoc agrees to work for that new faculty member. That is generally a difficult circumstance because a new faculty member, every single idea that they have that is possibly fundable, they need to fund it themselves. They need to write that grant for themselves. What a postdoc needs is to be able to develop something that they can take away from that lab. A, a postdoc who wants to be faculty has to develop something that they can take away. By definition, they are taking something away. So as you look for postdocs, if you want to be in academics, it's probably a better idea for you to look at bigger labs, more senior labs, uh, more well-funded labs who have something to give away. A brand new assistant professor, you might be able to go there and learn a super cool technique, but there's a very good chance that if you do manage to get a faculty position, you're gonna be competing with them, and you're not gonna be as good at it probably as they are because you're gonna be five years behind them, right? So I think, I think you have to be careful about the choices, and you wanna know who has sent other people out to Faculty. Now, if you are a postdoc who wants to, and now if you're a fac junior faculty member and a postdoc comes to you and they're like, I know I don't want to go into academics, I want to go into industry, I just need to get some good papers or something, that's bonus because then you get a postdoc who's got the experience already. Um, <coughs> they know how to do techniques, they know how to think, they're a good scientist, they've already had a lot of that training, but they're not going to compete to take something away from you. I mean, to be perfectly honest, I was not in a position to have a postdoc in my lab until I was an associate professor. I didn't have anything I could give away because I needed to write for that, those things. But graduate students were awesome because graduate students came in, they worked exactly on what I was working on, they generated data that helped me get my next grant, and then they went away to another postdoc and did whatever they wanted to do next. So I think who you mentor when in your career is a very important distinction. Um, the other thing, which is you know maybe a little bit depressing for this audience to think about, is that truthfully my first hire was a staff member, and a staff member is a good hire because you're not paying tuition on them, <laughs> and you're not gen. I mean you know PhDs should get paid more than we do, frankly, but as a junior faculty member starting off, your budget is going to be tight, and so a dedicated staff member could be the most relevant hire. And I was lucky; I hired a lab manager my first year who stayed with me, who's who, retiring this year, who's been with me for 23 years now. Um, that person has been my right arm throughout every, you know, I, in fact, I, I like to tell the trainees, I was like, you are transient, she stays, you know, <laughs> she gets to choose, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, thinking about who you hire, when and where, is makes a big difference. And, and also, as you're looking at labs to go to, if you're really wanting to do academics, you have to really have that hard conversation about whether that lab can support something that you can take with you. Um, and that's gonna be rare, unless they are an associate professor or higher, for the most part. Yes? Um, so I'm looking at number 11, just have a plan and but be flexible. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I guess the thing that I'm sort of mostly struggling with, I feel like, is trying to figure out how to distinguish myself from my PI. I mean, I'm sort of early on, so I've got time. Postdoc uh, or grad student, by the way? Sorry? Are you postdoc post or grad student? Postdoc, okay. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I guess be open to opportunity, but also be aware of sort of what your skill set coming is, in, is and like over diluting yourself and sort of finding your niche, I guess, is yeah. sort of trying to figure out. Well, I'll, I'll just tell you, I mean, I'm not sure I know perfectly how to answer it, but I'll tell you. So one, one strategy, it's, it's funny, if you ask people if you should stay in the same field or change, can I ask, did you stay in the same field as your PhD or something really. quite different? Not really. Okay. So some people will tell you that if it's bad to stay in the same field, you get all this diversity of ideas. That's all true. But the truth is, is that this knowledge that you accumulate in the field that you're working in 
it definitely is cumulative and so people who kind of stay in something related and move from graduate school to postdoc and something sort of related they know all the people in there those people make it faster so Gary Huffnagel was an example Gary and I were in graduate school together at the same time but Gary made full professor about seven years before I did because he started off in crypto and he stayed in crypto and he did very well in there so um, so, so that's one thing as far as differentiating yourself from the PI's lab that you're in right now that I think it can be a couple of different things. I'll tell you where I finally got my. So I, when I first came to Michigan and got a chance to write my first grant, I came to a lab that was working on chemokines and angiogenesis, and the lab was a lung cancer lab. That's how I got in the pulmonary division. Um, and what I did different was do a lot of the same things, but I did it in a prostate cancer model. That was what made me different. So I still was publishing on lung cancer, but I started off over here on prostate cancer. And I gotta tell you, I went to grad school because I wanted to work on cancer. I was so excited when I got this job because it was a cancer job. And guess what, my PI left. <laughs> and he went to UCLA and he didn't offer to take me with him. <laughs> so there I was, with a, and I did fortunately get a grant, but I had a grant to do prostate cancer and I was a faculty member in the pulmonary division. And I remember my then division chief, Galen Tames, called me into his office and he's like, I don't care what you do with that grant, but it's got to do something related to the lung. <laughs> you got to turn it around some way. And you know, that was, so I had to be flexible, right? And then to be honest, I couldn't do lung cancer. Bob did lung cancer. He was going to UCLA. There was no way I was competing with him. So to be perfectly honest, that's why it's a grant, not a contract. We took the money from the grant and I started a chemokine project related to lung fibrosis. Nothing to do with what that grant was on. But that was the data that we generated. That became the CCR2 paper, and that launched my career. And guess what? I trained as an immunologist, and pulmonary fibrosis is a whole lot about macrophage, or about a little bit of macrophage, but a lot about uh, fibroblasts and epithelial cells, so about which I felt like I knew this much about. <laughs> but that was the direction the data needed to go. So that's what I mean by be flexible. So in trying to differentiate yourself from your current PI, I guess my, you know, there's a couple of ways to do it. If you guys have done a big single cell RNA-seq, is there a set of 10 genes that can be yours to follow up on and he's got the other 500 or she? You know, is there a cell line that you can study that's different than this? Is there a mutation you can make that can be your specific, you know, are there, is there a protein that needs four different mutations studied? Can one of them be yours and three others be somebody else? You know, that kind of thing. So I mean, I'm happy to talk afterwards about maybe specific ideas, but those are generally the kinds of things that you try to pivot. Or another great thing is like, um, you know, let's say you're in an immuno, like right now, immunometabolism is a super hot field right now, but we have, we have metabolism experts at Michigan and we have immunology experts at Michigan. Um, we don't have that many people that do immunometabolism. And so a student in our program right now that's, that's working between two labs to kind of get that information, um, you know, is creating a niche that might be considered a unique niche there. So it's that kind of thing. So if there's a collaboration or a technique that you can learn, something like that, that'll help differentiate you. But it's important because when you write these training grants, um, a big thing that they look for in these K22s, KO1s, those kind of grants is how do you make yourself something not, that's not a clone of your mentor. The NIH is not really interested in cloning. At least cloning us. <laughs> you know, so. So I think you touched on the idea of like collaboration a little bit just then. So what are some ways as a graduate student or a postdoc that you can practice um, collaborating so that you're better at it when you're a faculty? Yeah, well I think graduates, I mean, you know, doing these kinds of, you guys are actually the best at establishing collaborations because you reach out to, you know, you go to your, you know, picnic or whatever, you're talking, you know, whatever, you know, other people are doing, you ask them for help. This is the time to collaborate. And I mean, you should look around you because I cannot tell you how important people I went to graduate school with who did nothing, you know, like I, I think I've told some of you this before, when I finally got to the point that I wanted to study um, gamma or herpes viruses and fibrosis, I was thrilled to look in the literature and find out that somebody I went to graduate school with was working on gamma herpes viruses. She wasn't when we were in graduate school together, but that was like, hey, great, I can call up Linda Van Dyke and ask her to send me this virus, and that really worked well. So you will be amazed, you know, keep up with these people around you because you'll be amazed at where these people go and what, what connections they'll have for you or who they'll know. They might be at the same university as somebody else you want. So that kind of stuff is good. So these connections you're making right now are important. And you may not realize they're important for the next 20 years, but they will come back and be important. So stay in touch. <laughs> That's one thing that I think is important. Then as far as collaboration, 
you guys are the best at it. You know, reach out, go to another lab, and then let, this is my thought is, if somebody comes to you and says, can you help me do, like, let's just give an example from my lab. My lab knows how to do TISNI analysis of our flow cytometry data, does it fairly well. A lot of people come to us for that help. I mean, Steve Grzynski, who happens to be a junior faculty member in the lab, you know, and I were having this conversation, you know, how much is too much? You know, when do I say no to this? And I said, well, you know, if it seems like it's a collaboration that, you know, you might be able to get your name in the paper somewhere, you should say yes. If you teach them how to do it and then they don't take good notes and they come back to you to do the same thing again or whatever, then it's time to say no because they need to move it on. So, so I, what I would say is, you know, be willing to help people when they come to you. But if you're the person asking for collaborative help, you should go trying to learn how to do it yourself. I mean, or at the very beginning of the collaboration, you should set up and say, I'm not going to learn how to do this Tisney myself. I'm going to give you five experiments I anticipate. If you do all five of these experiments, you'll be on the paper. But I'm, you're not going to have to teach me how to do it. I'm just asking you to do it for me. And then it's just a matter of trying to decide. I think in general, these collaborative papers, they, they come around and they help. It's going, my, I think on my CV, um, just because they made me do this for <laughs> department chair, I think I counted, I think I have 180 publications right now. I think only 60 of those am I first or last author on. That means I have 120 publications where I'm somewhere in the middle. Um, but you know what? When people look at my CV, they see 180 publications. They don't bother to go down and count that there's only 60 of them that are my primaries or whatever. Um, so I think that that helps. So I think if you can do a collaboration, help somebody else out, especially if there's a path to a publication, that is worth your time. For sure. But when you're the one asking, make sure you know whether you're asking them to do you a favor or whether you're asking them to teach you how to do something, in which case you do try to learn to do it yourself. Because <laughs> it's very annoying for some, like, you know, for instance, bone marrow transplants. We just do bone marrow transplants for people because there's way too much regulatory stuff for them to learn how to do it themselves. So we just do it for them. But for Tisney analysis, you know, if, if you come back to Steve and ask him to help you for the fifth time, he's getting really annoyed, I promise. <laughs> yeah. uh, hopefully that helps. Yes? I have a related question. Uh, first of all, thanks for providing this comprehensive list. It's good to know all the things that one needs to succeed in science. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know if I can guarantee it's that comprehensive. <laughs> I have one more thing uh, that we hear a lot about these days. Um, you know, there's a networking and I have not figured out the best way to do that for academic, academic jobs and it was interesting that you mentioned that when you were in Stanford your somebody in your network told you about this position in Michigan uh, so as postdocs who are in the job market what is the best way to do network should we just go to conferences talk to as many people as possible or what what should we uh, what well so, there, so I have two possible answers to that. For, first of all, I mean, I think it's always, a, if there's somebody at the conference that you would like to postdoc with, then you should definitely walk up to them and try to introduce them. I think if you go to a conference with no plan to try to meet someone in particular, that's not necessarily a good use of your time. I will tell you that faculty, I probably get three or four a week requests to be a postdoc in my lab. 95% um, of them, I scan and ignore or, or write back and just say, I'm sorry, I don't have a position. The ones that make me stop and look are when they write to me and they say, you know, although my background is this, I've looked at your work, I'm very interested in this, or, you know, or I, I know I have this skill set that I think I could apply to this or something. So if you want to, I think what you want to do as a postdoc is you want to figure out what area do you want to be in for your faculty position. Um, you know, if you want to do, do you need to go to a lab to learn how to, you know, I mean, you, and there's two things. You can either go to a lab to learn a technique that's going to help you address some question that you already know how to do from your graduate school, or you're going to a lab to learn how to do some new area of science, neuroscience. You know, you trained as a zebrafish person, now you want to go do, you know, mouse neuroscience stuff. And so you're really trying to make that pivot. I think if you write a thoughtful cover letter to the email, you can cold email, you know, somebody that you're interested in and, and see. Because if you write a letter where it's clear that you spent a little bit of time, you know what they're doing, you're making some suggestion about what skill you could bring to them, that's always somebody that I'll usually reach out to and at least, I mean, if I can afford them at all, I usually at least try to reach out and try to talk to them about it. Um, the other thing is do not be afraid to use contacts here, your PI, people your PI know, to contact people for you. <laughs> So I do this all the time for the graduate students that want to go postdoc for immunology. I will reach out, you know, even if I don't know them, 
I can send an email that says I'm the grad director of, at Michigan, you know, I have a student who's great, really wants to do this, they're very interested in your lab, they're going to be contacting you this week, please be looking for their email. So, you know, if you, you can call me to do that now if you want to. I mean, you know, really somebody like that can help you make those connections. So I don't think networking necessarily means that you have to physically talk to somebody like at a conference. You can talk to somebody next door to you who can help make that email introduction to help, you know, that happen. So you'd say the same for faculty jobs because these days I hear that there are 300 applications for one position and if somebody knows people in the department somehow, I mean, they'd be more comfortable interviewing that person? I think that's true. I think that when you've got 300 applications and you've sorted them and you have your top 10 or whatever that you're looking at, but somebody calls you about someone who's in the, uh, the, the other pile, then you tend to make 11 slots so that you can look at that person too. So that is true. Um, but what you've got to make sure that, and I think there's one of my points on there, make sure that the reputation you have right now is that you are collaborative, that you are hardworking, that you are a thoughtful scientist, that you, you know, show up, go to conferences, ask good questions. Make sure that when they call to give a recommendation for you, they're going to say things about you that are positive, you know. Um, because the other, the other way happens too, right? <laughs> People call, well, you know, really great scientist, but, um, you know, super difficult to get along with, had a real problem with, you know, the technician in that lab, you know, never, um, you know, never cleans up their bench after themselves, you know, whatever it is. I mean, the, the bad stuff gets reported too. So I think your job now is to try to, you know, do your best to be your best professional self now so that the references people will have about you will be the best possible references. I think that gets <clears throat> into the point about being professional and kind. <laughs> Um, is there any particular event during your tra the training part before you got to faculty that helped you understand better how to practice these skills of just being aware of different people or from different situations? Were there any, like, I guess that would go back to the extracurricular activities <laughs> that um, helped you practice those skills before you came to faculty? I mean, to be perfectly honest, um, I did not get along well with my PhD mentor. We just were not, we didn't see eye to eye. Uh, especially when I told her that I was pregnant, that did not go well. <laughs> I think her exact words were, well, that's a mistake. <laughs> um, you know, I guess you have to live with that now, I think so. So, you know, she was not, but she was a very good scientist, but she was not someone I liked. And I knew that I wanted to have a chance to have my own lab so that I could do it different, or try to do it different. Now, I've had 10 graduate students over the years. I've loved all of them. I thought I was doing my very best possible job, but I can tell you all of those two, except for maybe Helen and Melissa haven't been in my office yet, but over the years, I think all of the eight that have graduated were in my office crying and furious with me about something at one point or another. So I still, you know, you still screw up, even though I think, you know, I've tried to be better than what I thought I had. Um, you know, we, we just make mistakes. Human nature is different, and I can tell you that um, relationship, you know, my, my relationship with some of my female graduate students has been very different than some of my relationships with my male graduate students just because the women tend to tell me more about their personal lives than the men did along the ways and you know they just develop these different relationships um, I, all of it can work and all of it, it can be good but it is all different I mean and there's definitely you should just know there's going to be ups and downs in any relationship I mean there is no perfect mentorship relationship and there's no one person who can provide all of the mentoring that you need around every area. So you're really going to want to reach out to different people. And sometimes peer mentors are the best. I mean, to be perfectly honest, um, I will say right now, one of my hardest transitions right now is that Deneen Wellick, for those of you who knew Deneen Wellick when she was here, one of my dearest friends, and by far the woman that I went to all the time when I just needed to blow off steam or gripe about something, Deneen was my sounding board and I was hers. And she moved to Wisconsin and I miss her like crazy because that is such an important <coughs> thing to have is somebody who you can go say whatever you need to say to who gets it, right? And so find amongst yourselves somebody who can be the one person who you can blow off steam to and you can gripe about, but that's not gonna go tell three other people that you griped about because you don't want that to spread, you know? So I think, you know, I think finding those kinds of, um, you know, whoever can be the right mentor for those things is important. Um, other than that, I mean, so my PhD mentor and I did not see eye to eye, but I appreciate her a lot now. She did teach me how to plan an experiment, how to design an experiment, and she, um, and she was, 
she did more for me than I realized at the time because she um, demanded you do the work and you know she was not going to take sloppiness you know if it took you longer to do it you needed to go back and redo it. I mean all of those things I think are skills that have helped me be better now um, other than that I think it's just from a lot of watching and hearing you know watching people you see what works and you see what doesn't work but almost all, all mentoring issues can break can be boiled down to whether the communication is clear. It's everything that goes wrong is just a difference in expectation. And so if you have not done those kinds of more mentoring agreements, where I know they're like kind of tragically terrible to sit there and all, but there is something that's important about saying to your mentor, how many hours do you expect me to be in the lab? If I'm working, if I'm reading, do I have to be sitting at my desk? Or are you going to see that vet? Or can I go to the library? If I leave the lab, do I need to tell you I leave the lab? If I'm not going to be in the lab on Friday, do I need to let you know ahead of time? Or is it just that flexible? And because the answer to that is very different depending on what lab that you work in. And so you just have to know what the expectation of your mentor is and what your expectation is. And then when it's different, I think usually most things can be solved when you go and say, you know, I thought this meant this, or you know, I was expecting this, you know, and then you can usually work those things out. So almost all, you know, as grad chair, almost all the mentor mentee, you know, sorts of things. It's always just been, you know, this is what said the mentor read it this way, the student read it this way, you know, and they were just differences of opinion or differences in how they viewed it. So I don't know if that helps. You cannot be too clear. How did you maintain a balance between your postdoc and your kids as you were having kids? <laughs> I am afraid that I am not the poster child for work-life balance. <laughs> I think I said something on that. I mean, I will say, um, I mean, I just told you, I was not as successful a postdoc as I probably could have been. So, um, but I will tell you this, when I was a graduate student, I worked a lot of hours. You know, I got in early and, you know, we pretty much ate dinner together. We were there, we were there all day. We also didn't make enough money to go anywhere else. So we all just stayed there all the time. I worked a lot more hours as a graduate student, but I was a much more productive postdoc because when I had children, I couldn't drop them off before 7.30 and I had to pick them up by 6. And so now my day got shortened and I learned to be far more productive because I couldn't just go get a cup of coffee and, you know, sit there and chat about whatever the news NPR was, you know, because I didn't have time to do that. I learned to calendar. I think I put this on, if you do not keep a calendar now, that is by far one of my most prominent pieces of advice. You should plan your experiments and write down, I mean, it, it happens a lot, I see this where you know, there'll be a harvest and you know, if that harvest is gonna take you six hours, you block off six hours on your calendar for that day so that you know I can't start another experiment that's gonna take six hours that day or that's not gonna work. Um, you know, and if you plan enough in advance so that you make sure that you've ordered the mice and they're here on time and you've ordered the reagents you're gonna need and you've checked to make sure you have enough of the reagents you're gonna need and all those kinds of things, all of that stuff can really increase your efficiency. When I was a graduate student, you know, it was not uncommon for me to go start an experiment and realize I didn't have the antibody I needed or I didn't have the whatever I needed. I made those kinds of mistakes all the time. Then as a postdoc, I learned not to make those mistakes. And to be honest, um, you know, between when my children were still tiny, you know, were still in, a, you know, kind of preschool ages, it was hard. Um, I will not lie to you, I remember my husband and I sitting at a kitchen table one day and being like, okay, one of us is going to take one kid and one of us is going to take the other kid. There's no way, this is, we, can't, we cannot keep this up. I mean, we just thought we could not manage. Um, and a big difference for us was we just decided to go in debt um, to be able to, you know, pay for the daycare and stuff. You know, we, we were trying, you know, we just decided, we, we finally got to the point we needed another car. We were trying to make it work on one car. It was like impossible. We did not have the money to buy another car, but we just did it anyway. And just, you know, when I started my faculty position here, we had all kinds of debt. I mean, because we just, it was that or we were gonna divorce because it was like impossible to do. When my kids were little, I tried very hard to, you know, have dinner, you know, go home and be for dinner. And then when the kids would go to bed, I stayed up and I read and did a lot of work I could um, at night. So. Um, I would love to tell you that I, when I went home at night, I never did any more work. That's not true. I, I always work at night. I still work on the weekends. I still work at night. Um, but what I will say about science is that it's a flexible job. And there were definitely, what I tried to do was just when there was something, like when we went on vacation, I tried to go on vacation. Uh, when they had something that was important to do, I tried to do that. But I will tell you, I did not make every soccer game. I did not make every music practice. 
I did not get to everything, but I tried to do important things. And probably realistically, my work-life balance is 75 work, 25% home. When my kids were smaller, it was probably 60, 40, maybe something like that. But then after the kids get older, this is another thing to remember, that time does change. There's a huge difference between what you can do when your kids are five versus when they're 12 versus when they're 25, <laughs> you know? So, um, so that does change over the course of your career. So sometimes you just have to grin and bear it and get through it. And I do not have any magic words. I really, I think the most important thing I wrote on there is I think if you want a career in academics, I think what you have to say to yourself is I refuse to quit. I'm not going to quit until they kick me out. And, and that's what I always said. I said, I'm gonna sell shoes if they kick me out. But until they kick me out, I'm just going to do whatever it takes, right, whatever, grant. I mean, you, you just never shut the door. And I have to say, that's one thing as a grad director I've seen is I see a lot of times people opt out before they try. They get scared. They think it's hard. There's nothing in life that's not hard. There's nothing in life that's worth having that's not hard. So don't opt out. Don't you yourself psych yourself out before you try it. Um, I remember my dad gave me a piece of advice once. He said, if you're in the top 10% of anything, you usually can find a job. And that's what I've tried to be. And if you're at the University of Michigan as a graduate student or a postdoc, you have a very good shot at being in the top 10% of whatever you do. So just keep plugging. <laughs> don't quit. Yeah. So once you became a faculty, do you, did you have any legal room for actually doing independent research yourself? or that had to go out the door because of... Um, oh, good question. You mean for me personally in the lab? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. So I would, for my first three graduate students, for better or worse, I was at the bench with them <laughs> day by day. Um, I will say even like, the whole time, I was, obviously the whole time I was a research track faculty member, I didn't have any, I mean, I didn't get a graduate student until I was on the tenure track. Um, so I was faculty here for seven years before I was able to switch to the tenure track and I didn't get a student until I, I had been here eight years. So for those first eight years, I was at the bench every day uh, working. Um, for my first three graduate students, I would say I was working at the bench probably 50% of the time. Um, but once I got to the point that I took over the immunology graduate program, it was really the administrative responsibilities that, that took me away from the bench. Um, and so I have not worked at the bench in the last, say, eight years, except that sometimes they let me come in and count differentials. <laughs> or I can, st I can still go in and help with a BAL if it's a big harvest day or something. Um, but yeah, it, it's a very weird thing is that the, there are people in my lab now do things that I don't know how to teach. And that's another, maybe one point I'll just touch on is that, you know, if you're trying to figure out are you ready to go apply for a faculty positions or whatever, what you have to be able to do is teach the people who you hire how to do your science. And so um, we've seen this ha go poorly with some hires here and that sometimes we've hired some faculty who've come from big labs where they had a lot of um, help, a lot of sort of technical expertise help, and then they get here and they realize that, oh, you know, you need that piece of equipment, I didn't put that piece of, you know, you need to do that. You know, they don't really know how to do their science. So one of the best things you can do is make sure that you physically know how to do your experiments and you can physically teach somebody else how to do them. I think that's a major point in knowing if you're ready to transition. I think one of the only points that we didn't touch on in some form or fashion was maybe um, knowing what your science costs. No, <laughs> yeah. So what can you do as a trainee to prepare for having to write budgets and hire people? Right. Um, so I mean, I think uh, I think in the one hand, it shouldn't be your responsibility so much at this point, but it is good to just know what science costs. Um, mouse work is ex extraordinarily expensive. Um, if you're doing human work, actually, it's much cheaper because a lot of times, you know, you don't have to pay to get your samples and things like that. So you should just be aware. I mean, um, I think it's a good idea, maybe not even so much as a graduate student, but especially as you move into postdoc, to just realize a mouse costs $20, that a cage of five mice costs a dollar a day. If I leave them sitting downstairs for six weeks before I start to do my experiment, that six times seven is 42, that costs $42 times the 10 cages. Oh, whoops, that was $420, you know, that we just spent. So I think it's a good idea to just sort of know what the cost of antibodies are and the things like that. And if you're in your fourth year of postdoc or whatever, you're really getting ready to transition, it's probably a good idea to start kind of keeping a log of just the general sorts of costs because they're gonna ask you to give them a list of what you want as a startup package. 
Um, and there may be some general rules about it, but definitely you'll be able to justify certain things. And believe me, if you're doing a lot of mouse work or you have long experiments that have a lot of per diem and things like that, you may need to justify a little bit more money to get started. And so I think it's just a good idea to be cognizant of about what it costs. And then remember that whatever salaries, you know, graduate students make, you know, thirty-ish thousand dollars a year, but then there's another, you know, twenty-four to seventeen thousand dollars a year of tuition on top of that. You know, postdocs make, you know, let's say fifty thousand dollars a year, but then there's another thirty percent of that is that which is their benefits, which they should absolutely get, but then those come out of the direct costs of your lab. And so um, the truth, truth of the matter is that what is hard today, and especially now that universities are causing PIs to put more of their own salaries on their grants, which is a big problem, but it's true today, a $250,000 R01 budget is probably enough to pay 30% of the PI salary, maybe a technician, and maybe one other person. You are not going to pay for more than three people on any one grant. Um, and so if you think about what kind of size lab that you want to have, you have to start thinking about how many grants that takes to run. And if there's mouse costs on there, maybe you can only afford two people per grant. So I think it's just a good idea to sort of have some idea. I mean, um, a lot of times students say to me, they're like, oh, you know, if I could just get the one R1, that would be fine. But the truth of the matter is, is it's hard to run a lab on one R01. I mean, that is, that is the truth. But it's so wonderful when you get one. The thrill of getting it makes it totally worth writing it. <laughs> so don't be daunted. And there's a lot of university support for in between. That's the other thing is I think uh, you forget that you know there should be backup from your university. There should be bridging funds and things like that to help you get through the dips because it is a cyclical thing. And I think one final question in the last minute would be, what is the one thing that you wish you had better prepared for during your training? stage for oh. being a faculty member. God, I wish I'd taken biostatistics. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I'd taken biostatistics. Right now, I wish I, I wish I knew anything about coding. I think data science and that kind of stuff is like a big new area, so I think you guys should train for that. Um, and the one thing that I'm lousy at that I wish I had had better practice at is um, I have a hard time having a difficult conversation with some, you know, telling somebody that they're not working hard enough or telling somebody that they're you know, that they've disappointed you or whatever, or, or why, or so those, those are difficult conversations. Um, and the HR piece of running a lab can be very, you know, I've my, like I said, I've had my technician for 22 years, but she's definitely got a big personality. <laughs> and, you know, like trying to mediate her personality versus other people in the lab, I've really done that fairly terribly sometimes, <laughs> so. Okay, I think that's everything. Mostly, right. thank you. Yeah.